I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by uh, Terry Smith, who runs the Fund Smith Equity Fund and really needs little introduction. Uh, known as the English Warren Buffett, uh, he, was, he has an enviable reputation as a star stock picker, and it is a great honor and privilege to be with him today and get a little insight into what makes him and his fund so successful. I was reading a 2018 article in The Guardian in preparation for today. It started with, prepare yourself for an unusually gushing assessment of a super rich money manager currently ensconced in a luxury home in an Indian ocean paradise. It went on to say, some people compare him to the great Warren Buffett, but Smith is probably better. Praise indeed, and three years on, his portfolio has consistently outperformed, confounding all the doubters. So exactly what is he doing? And what are the reasons for Terry's success? From my dip into his recent book, Investing for Growth, Terry talks about his well-known investment approach, being buy good companies, don't overpay, and do nothing. Sounds pretty simple. And reading one of his articles in the FT from 2015, it is very clear that both the Sage of Omaha and Terry also share a lot in common in terms of investment philosophy. Terry himself references Warren Buffett's 1979 annual letter. The primary test of a managerial economic performance is the achievement of a high earnings rate on equity capital employed. He will explain that, not me, and not the acknowledgement of consistent gains in earnings per share, citing that both he and Mr. Buffett aspire to invest along those lines. So I hope you are all as excited as I am to be learning more. And just to the format of today's session. Firstly, Terry is going to give us a short presentation covering his approach to business, his career, his life and upbringing, and also managing the fund. Then we'll have some uh, Q&A, uh, and we have received some specific questions from clients in advance of our session, which we will look to answer at the end. Terry, I know you're going to touch on the recent accounting scandals and your take on whether they have impacted the trustworthiness of quoted businesses. Um, and I'd also be very interested to know uh, if your strong investment performance can continue given the size of your fund and, and the universe of good quality companies you're prepared to invest in. So with no more ado, Terry, thank you so much for joining us. Over to you. Uh, just to echo something that you said, yeah, please, uh, if you have questions, I mean, uh, as you say, you've got some in advance, which is good. Uh, do let me have them. Uh, one of the hallmarks of what we've tried to do with Fundsmith is to communicate very directly with investors what it is we're doing and why uh, in terms of the strategy and the, and the outcome for our fund for the very simple reason that we think uh, actually the better people understand what it is we're doing and indeed what we're not doing, the more likely it is that they'll have a good result, um, particularly when times are, are more difficult. It's, it's usually pretty easy to manage things when things are going well, but it's good that we all understand what we're doing uh, so that we can cope with other times uh, as well. Anyway, let's take you on. Um, uh, comrades, uh, if you have masters, I'm gonna to touch upon these um, topics which you gave me in advance, uh, David, to talk about. Me, I mean, uh, yeah, I can certainly talk about me and my career, more, more particularly my career and uh, how, uh, how it's got me to where I am in terms of managing the money. Uh, the type of thing of accounting, obviously I published accounting for growth in 1992, which was an expose of, uh, of people's uh, accounting malpractice, uh, which <laughs> very ironically became a number one bestseller and not Stephen Hawking's brief history of title number one. Uh, and is only slightly more understandable in my view. Anyway, I'll update you on my thinking such as on that. And then something about good companies, if there's nothing else that you understand or want to, to, uh, to, to get to grips with on what we do, it's why we invest in, in what we define as good companies and how we define that. That's a very important uh, subject. So the, it's absolutely the single most important thing we do. And then on to the Q&A. Uh, that's basically, it touches upon a few points in my career. I started with a career in, uh, in banking. I was a graduate trainee at a, bar, a bank, Barclays. Um, 
They then shipped me off to do an MBA um, and brought me back in as their group finance manager. They set up a group finance department to manage the bank's own uh, balance sheet and finances, which I did for uh, about four years, uh, basically. So I had a grounding uh, in banking. I'm actually an associate of the Chartered Institute of Bankers, would you believe? Um, I left there and went into um, uh, what was then stockbroking, investment banking as a bank analyst, and, uh, and, and went over the wall, as it were, into, into that area of endeavor. And I was the number one rated bank analyst for what it's worth for the next seven years. Um, I left there to uh, join uh, UBS Phillips and Drew, who had been involved in a, in a scam called the Blue Arrow Affair, now sort of lost in the mists of time. Uh, just as the 80s were turning into the 90s, they did a deal to finance a gentleman called Tony Berry with a, a, a company called Blur. I think he owned Spurs at one point. Conrad can uh, confirm or deny that for me later since he's a Spurs supporter. He used that to buy a manpower, the employment services company, with a huge convertible issue. I mean, this was 1990 or something like that. Uh, 1989 even possibly, and it was a 750 million pound issue. It went wrong, they lied about it very publicly, and as a result, the management was uh, all under arrest. And so they were looking for a head of research to quote, reclaim the moral high ground. So they hired yours truly as their head of research. As I always say, joking, I think I reclaimed the moral high ground just a notch too high uh, for their liking, because um, uh, when I joined, it was in 1990, there was an economic downturn uh, going on of some magnitude caused by the, uh, uh, Iraqi invasion of Kuwait and the resulting spike in the oil price. Um, and one of the features of it was that quite large public companies, uh, Polypec, British and Commonwealth, were going bust. Um, in some cases, within record time after report, uh, just after reporting record profits, Polypec, I think, went from six weeks from a record profit to insolvency, which is quite good going. Um, and, um, and so I wrote a, res a research report, accounting for growth, I called it. It was a pun. Is the, are these companies actually growing or is it all just legend of man, accounting artifice and so on? And it got voted the number one piece of research in London that year. Uh, and then I was approached by Random House uh, to see whether I would write a book based upon it, which I did with the same title. Um, and some of UBS's clients who were probably on the, uh, the wrong side of this particular divide got jolly upset and uh, uh, complained about me and I got fired and sued by UBS. And um, uh, the rest, as I say, is history. The book went to number one in the bestseller list um, and, uh, and I was no longer in employment, um, which, of course, and one of the things I say to people about getting fired is, uh, you know, first of all, it's interesting to have been fired, if you're, particularly if you're going to fire other people from time to time, interesting to know what it feels like. Um, it also was actually the best thing that ever happened to me in career terms, though it didn't feel like it, I can tell you at the time, because it forced me to go out on my own. I went and joined a startup called Colin Stewart, uh, which sold out to Canaccord, of course. So in many respects, uh, David, you're sort of sitting in part of the, the sort of uh, the legacy of all that. Um, it was a hugely successful startup in investment banking and wealth management. Um, I was employee number nine. And as time progressed, I ended up being the CEO of the company and uh, leading a uh, management buyout to buy uh, the, the, the firm out of Singer and Friedlander, the, uh, the, the investment bank that had helped found it. Um, and then I took it public through an IPO. And as I say, eventually it ended up uh, as part of Canaccord. During that time, uh, when we started Collins Street, it quickly became a, uh, clear. Well, first of all, I was the head of research, although given that I was employee number nine, there wasn't much to be head of that we weren't going to be able to hire a sort of a bench of number one rated analysts. So we had to try something different. And so I hired a mathematician called Neil Dark, who I think um, David is literally presenting from his office uh, at Colin Stewart. And uh, he and a couple of others worked with me on building uh, a database and model to look at companies, to assess them and value them based upon their cash flows. It's called Quest. And I think it's still in existence. And it's kind of one of the foundation blocks of the way that I and we think about companies, uh, basically. Um, at the, the, the turn of the, the millennium, so in, uh, in 2000, I IPO'd uh, Colin Stewart. And in 2003, I used it to buy a company called Tullet uh, Liberty, as it was then, uh, the second biggest interdealer broker in the world. These are the companies that do the bargains between primarily banks in things that are not quoted on exchanges, uh, interest rates, um, oil, gas, um, uh, foreign exchange, et cetera, et cetera. And we grew that business. We bought Prebond, which was the number four, and put the two of them together in a merger, um, and so on and so on. A couple of things to say about this period. Um, one of them was when I acquired Tullet, it had a defined benefit pension plan uh, with a large deficit. The assets were about two thirds of the estimated liabilities. Not an unusual situation. 
not one that we were, that was unexpected, our due diligence had revealed it. But what I did is I persuaded the trustees to go for a dramatic change of strategy um, and appoint me as a sole investment advisor. And we went for a strategy of investing in about 20 very high quality equities with a buy and hold strategy. It probably sounds quite familiar. It basically, if you like, in many respects, was the test bed for what we went on to do at Fundsmith. And um, Tullet Prebon no longer has a defined benefit plan. We managed to turn it into a significant surplus without putting any new capital into it from the company uh, to the point where they're able to on sell it to an insurer and relieve themselves of the liability. It was a great success, um, uh, basically. Um, anyway, um, after I'd been there for a while, 2010, Colin Stewart was sold off to, uh, to Canacool and I had a bit of a gap in my, uh, my, my activities because I, where the two companies had been separate, I had a contract which enabled me to do another job. So I set up Fundsmith. I got together with some uh, old colleagues of mine from uh, Colin Stewart. So Julian Robbins, who's our head of research, uh, Mark Lawrence, who uh, is our head of marketing, Greville Ward, who does our high net worth marketing and marketing in the US. Uh, and uh, and uh, founded Fundsmith with my own money, uh, basically with the aim of trying to do something a bit different in fund management, which we thought needed it uh, in terms of the, the type of product that we were going to offer to people, which obviously uh, I'm going to come on to talk about a bit more. What would I take out of all that, or would I suggest you take out of all that, if, if anything, about my background and how it affects what I do and so on? I, unique is, a, is an overused word, but I'm certainly in an unusual position. I'm not sure it's absolutely unique, but it's very unusual. Um, I'm a person who's run companies. I've run two companies, Colin Stewart and Tullet Prebon, two public companies, in fact. Well, I ran them from being private and into being public. Um, and I manage a fund, and I manage a fund. Not many people do both those things. Not many people who run companies become fund managers, and not many fund managers go on to run companies. Um, uh, these two things are quite separate in the world. And I think if you're going to invest like we do, where we really want to own businesses and we want to own them for the very long term, and we want to own very good businesses, which will do the heavy lifting of compounding returns for us, having run companies, I think, is a very distinct advantage, uh, basically. So I think that's the one thing I would take out of it, that I've got an unusual background in having both run companies and now running uh, money for people. Uh, enough about me accounting. Basically, the, the question you kind of set me in advance, I think, David, was, well, you wrote accounting for growth. That was, believe it or not, nearly 30 years ago now. Wow, time flies. Um, what's changed in the meantime? Are company accounts any more reliable? Are they less reliable? Well, after I wrote accounting for growth, actually, the accountants um, got their act together quite a bit. Um, uh, and Sir David Tweedy, who was one of the driving forces behind it in reforming accounting, uh, actually gave me a bit of credit for causing a, 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 a sort of an incident which helped his cause. Um, and I think actually accounting has substantially improved. I think the problem with accounting now isn't the accounts, it's whether or not anybody's actually reading the things and, and doing anything about it. And I'm going to give you five examples of that to, uh, to maybe bring you slightly more up to date, or certainly a lot more up to date than accounting for growth. These five that I've got on the slide, IBM, Clorox, Mondelez, Carillion uh, and Wirecard. Comrade, you take us on, please. Um, in the 2009 annual report for, uh, for IBM, when we were analyzing it, we discovered a $1.9 billion mistake. Um, now, it's quite a lot of money, um, even if you say it quickly. And uh, we were analyzing this company in 2010 because we were setting up Fundsmith and we were looking at it as a possible investment. And uh, I'm not absolutely, I don't know for sure that we're the only people who spotted it, but I think we are. Um, because what we did when we spotted it is, first of all, Julian and I discussed it to see whether we thought we both agreed, and we did. Then Julian rang up the IR department of IBM and said, look, um, I've got a bit of a question. Can you tell us about this? Um, and Julie, eventually, they did the thing that all IR departments do, which is call, get somebody to call us back who knew about it, who said, you're absolutely right. The cash flow is wrong by $1.9 billion. And we said, oh, that's, <laughs> isn't that interesting? Um, apart from not uh, giving us any great enthusiasm for IBM, we said, Anybody else sort of rang up, pointed this out, asked any questions about it? Nope, not a soul, they said. So if anybody else did uh, spot it, they certainly didn't ring up and ask about it. And ironically, at the same time, Warren Buffett, the sage of Omaha, was buying his stake. Now, I, you know, I'm fairly confident that Warren's people weren't reading these reports either, because if we go on to the next slide, this is a slide which covers the Berkshire Hathaway ownership of IBM. And I'm not saying all of this is down to a mistake in the accounts. Very far from it. It's just... It's one of those straws in the wind. 
uh, as it were. You can see that uh, from the, the purchase of Barclay Hathaway's position, uh, which was in the second quarter of, uh, of 2011 on there. So if you look at that, I think uh, Conrad's got a point, we can point you at roughly where it is. We've got a red line, which is the IBM uh, share price, which as you can see is flat line to going gently downhill. And a comparison with the gray line, which is the S&P 500 for that period, it was an utterly disastrous uh, investment for, for the uh, Barclay Hathaway. And I'm not trying to knock Warren Buffett at all, as you rightly said. I'm, I think, um, you know, A, you know, I've studied him for many years, right back to 1979, uh, and his, uh, what he's done is incredibly good. Um, but uh, it's one of those missteps which you certainly had enough to, so nobody was reading the accounts. Take us on, please, comrade. Um, not only does nobody read the accounts, but nobody seems to care very much either. Um, Clorox, which is a company we have owned, American fast-moving consumer products business, um, in 2014, the number that they show for their treasury stock purchase was a positive, not a negative in the cash flow. Like, how can that be? So again, the usual form occurred. We rang them up and said, to, you know, we're, I think we were shareholders at the time. Um, can you explain this to us? And they said, oh, it's a, it's a mistake. We've put the number in the wrong way around. We said, ah, oh, couldn't do anything about it. And they said, yep, we're going to correct it. We'll make a, a, a statement uh, in the 2015 account uh, correcting it. It wasn't. Nobody cares. Nobody's looking at this stuff. So it's not that the accounts are problematic so much as uh, what are people doing with them. Um, Carillion, this is the UK construction business uh, which went bust. Um, this is a, a slide which just shows the net income, the net profits you can see over a number of years prior to its uh, going bust. Uh, the free cash flow, this is the cash that it generates prior to the um, uh, uh, the payment of the dividend, so after paying for everything he has to pay out for, and then the cash conversion number, that's the uh, free cash flow divided by the net income, because not all profits arrive in cash. People have other things that they have to spend things on, like working capital and capital expenditure. Uh, not all profits, as I would say, are created equal. And uh, clearly what we like to see, and what actually the companies in our portfolio have got, is 100% cash conversion. All the profits arrive in cash. Uh, but you can see here, this is a pretty patchy record. You know, the, the cash conversion was minus 18.6%. So for every pound of profits, minus 20p appeared. Minus 80%. And now things, that's pretty uh, eye-catching. Things did get a bit better, but you can see it didn't get an awful lot better. They never managed to produce 100% of profits in cash. Uh, and by 2016, they were back down to the point where they were uh, producing uh, only 37% of their profits in cash. This is a sign. Profits are a lot easier to manufacture than cash, basically. Um, and this is a clear sign that all is not well with the company. If we, I don't know what the number is cumulative. We ended up the five years profits and the five years cash flow on that table. But clearly, that sort of cash conversion is pointing you to a problem. Almost certainly the problem is the profits are not real. Um, could take us on, comrade? And you can see from here, if you just read that and sold at any time during the years that that cash flow was poor and beginning to deteriorate again, you could have missed that nice cliff fall that occurred in 2017. It didn't require accounting reform to do this. It just required actually doing a few simple calculations from the accounts which were being supplied to you. So you might query oh, well, if the profits are being fixed, which was evidence, but the information was there in the accounts for you to do the work. No, it looks like we've missed, I'm sorry, we've dropped a slide, which was Mondelez. Um, it's basically about companies who make adjustments. One of the things to be very wary of uh, is companies who, when they're reporting, and you'll see this is, uh, there's a pandemic of this, never mind a pandemic of COVID in the world, uh, they'll report their actual numbers, their gap numbers, generally accepted accounting purpose numbers, but they'll actually spend far more time on so-called adjusted numbers. Um, my memory serves me well. The, uh, the Mondelez one spent something like 32 pages on adjustments in the results we were looking at, uh, compared with just four or five pages for the actual gap results. And of course, I mean, you needn't um, trouble you, the, you too much to think about the fact that um, when uh, people make adjustments, they take out the bad stuff. So they try to get us to believe that the reorganization expenses, the litigation expenses, um, the write downs that they have to make, et cetera, et cetera, are um, uh, in some way adjustments that you should ignore to the fictional adjusted profit number that they're trying to get you to, to present. Uh, Mondelez has been a particularly egregious 
um, uh, offender in this regard, particularly under previous management. Uh, but the pharmaceutical industry uh, on the whole is quite bad at it as well. If you look at the pharmaceutical companies, you'll find that they very often report adjusted uh, profits, which are seemingly accepted by the investment community, which exclude things like the write-off of intangibles, um, litigation expenses related to product liability, and, and uh, you know, uh, the restructuring expenses for m and In other words, some very big things which are a regular part of their business. Um, and therefore, it's, uh, it's not the accounts which are the problem, it's the adjusted numbers. Always be wary of anyone who tries to get you when they're talking about investment or analyzing a company to do it on the basis of the slideshow that the management put forward. Because the slideshow almost always has a little asterisk by the numbers that says adjusted. And you look at the bottom of the slides and say, have a look at the actual accounts. Go and get the report and accounts or the 10K if it's an American company and read the basic source material. That's what you need to do. Um, finally, um, Wirecard, this has obviously been a very big uh, incident, German uh, financial services business in the payment processing area, which has been disastrous. There are plenty of warnings, um, more red flags than the People's Liberation Army. The analyst uh, publication published on Wirecard first in July 2014 with 42 follow-up notes on this, warning about this fraud, yet nobody took any notice. All right, take this on. Um, that's what the share price did during the same period. The problem isn't whether or not the signs are there for people to analyze. They are whether or not they're doing the work and whether anyone is taking any notice. You know, people from investors in Wirecard to investors in Korean through to investors in IBM are basically got blinkers on when it comes to this information. The information, I think, is by and large pretty good. It's the use of it, which is the problem, or the, or the misuse or the non-use of it. Take some comment, please. Good companies, um, final segment. Um, I'll say what I think a good company is first, and then I'll come on to why we think it's important to invest in them. The primary measure of a good company in financial terms, which David um, touched upon in his um, introduction, I, I, I take from Warren Buffett's 1979 annual chairman's letter. The first and most important measure of a good company in financial terms is it makes a high return on operating profit, profit a capital in cash. The cash delivered in a reporting period divided by the capital employed is a high number. In our portfolio at the moment, it's probably 25%, something like that. It's a, uh, it's a high number, basically. Um, secondly, it has a source of growth which enables it to reinvest those cash flows. It's no good having wonderful returns on your business if you are landlocked into a, a very small segment, niche, or geography, and you can't deploy the cash that's being generated to grow the business. You need both of those elements to make a truly great uh, investment. And last, but by no means least, you need a source of sustainable capital advantage to prevent mean reversion. If you make 25% returns on capital and you've got very good growth to enable you to reinvest at 25%, uh, people are attracted to compete in your business. There's a perfectly good law of economics called mean reversion, which says that all returns revert to the mean in the end. It's not quite right, this law. Of course, the answer is most companies' returns revert to the mean or average in the end. There are a few companies that have got competitive advantage that enables them to fend off the impact of competition. I just want to touch upon each of those in turn. Come right, take us off. High returns on capital. Um, why is this important? Companies are just like us. People will overcomplicate analysis. Uh, companies have a cost of capital and a return on capital. Uh, if they make a return above their cost of capital consistently, then the value of the company grows over time. If they make a return below their cost of capital consistently, the value shrinks over time. Think of it in personal terms. If you go out to your bank and borrow money at 5% and you invested in funds for the last decade at 18%, you would have become more wealthy. Right? If you borrow from your bank at 5% and invested in somebody else's fund at 2% return, you would have become poorer. This is not, we don't need to get into um, higher mathematics here or any particularly sophisticated level of thinking. It's a fact. This is, this is the case. Yet, since Warren Buffett wrote that in his annual report in 1979, I would say more people in the investment community have ignored it than have used it, uh, basically. Take us on, comment, please. Um, this uh, um, quote from uh, Warren Buffett's uh, number two, Charlie Munger, uh, in many respects summarizes why this is important. So, you know, I think I've given a similar explanation. Here's a slightly lengthier explanation. I don't know why he chooses this time period or these particular rates, but it doesn't matter. 
I'll just read it. Over the long term, it's hard for a stock to earn a much better return than the business which underlies it returns. It earns. If the business earns 6% on capital over 40 years, and you hold it for that 40 years, you're not going to make much different to a 6% return. Here's the punchline. Even if you originally buy it at a huge discount. Conversely, if a business earns 18% on capital over 20 or 30 years, even if you pay an expensive looking price, you'll end up with one hell of a result. He's telling us something here, which is very important. This is not a theory. He's not putting forward a theory of investment. It's a mathematical fact. Uh, it's important to realize that. And what he's telling you here is something like this. I wish I had a, a diary that I kept from when I started in finance all those years ago, and that I put two columns in each day. And every time in the investment business, somebody asked me whether a, a company or a strategy was high quality, good, had high returns on capital, I would put a tick in one column. And every time they said, but is it cheap or expensive? I'd put a tick in that column. I would have far, far more ticks in the, is it cheap or expensive column. People spend almost their entire effort thinking about whether something's cheap or expensive, or highly rated or lowly rated, which I guess is a better way of expressing it, and far too little deciding whether it's a high grade business that they really want to own that can compound it value. Um, and I think uh, Munger basically um, uh, encapsulates why it's important in that quote. As I said, return on capital is the single most important thing. There's no point in engaging in a business that has low returns on capital. I haven't bothered today because we've got limited time, but we can show you a slide for the airline industry, uh, which never makes an adequate return on capital. And it is just a machine for losing money, basically. That is, there is no point in investing in business having adequate returns. However, once you've got adequate returns, you need to have a source of growth to enable you to reinvest. It's no good having a business that makes 25% return on capital, but you can't sell any more of the product or service and nothing, nothing for them to deploy more capital into. They just have to give you the, the cash back, basically. So we look for companies that have got a source of growth for them to invest in. When they invest in a very high quality companies franchise like that, at high rates of return on capital, they do a better job for you than I can ever do. I was asked in an article recently whether managers of companies are better at deploying capital than, than fund managers. And the answer is, it's not really a fair question because fund managers don't control businesses. The managers who are in control of very high quality business, some of the world's great consumer companies, tech companies, medical companies, and so on, have a different opportunity to fund managers. They have a business that can generate high returns to reinvest in. They just have to not screw it up basically. Easier said than done, but that's what they have to do. Um, where does this growth come from? We look for a business that has a, um, a source of secular growth, not cyclical growth, not it goes up and it goes down. Everything has a bit of cyclicality, but we're looking for, for companies which both at the peak and the trough of the business cycle are bigger than they were at previous uh, parts of the business cycle that grow, not in every reporting period or every year, but they do grow over time. And it typically comes from one or more of these things. Consumerization of the developing world. Um, you know, all the statistics on this are clear. When people in the developing world go past a certain level of disposable income, they become consumers. They're part of a developing economy. They no longer spend all their time sourcing and preparing food. They've got jobs in, uh, in factories and call centers and all kinds of things like that. They need the, the benefits of consumerization and they, they aspire to become consumers as well. Uh, and so that's a very big driver um, uh, of, the, uh, of the growth for some companies. Um, but in the developed world, there's premiumization. Um, we may not be consuming more, mostly, but we consume better uh, over time. You know, we may not drink more, uh, hopefully most of us don't, but we might drink better quality. We might upgrade what we do. So whatever it is we're talking about consuming, uh, there's quite a good chance that we will go up the curve in terms of uh, the brand of, uh, of goods that we're consuming over time and premiumize it. Aging populations, an awful lot of people look for growth in, in investment through young populations. In fact, that's part of the drive in the consumerization of the developing world. But aging populations are pretty good too. Aging populations have increased consumption for uh, a number of things, uh, and not least forms of medical care. Uh, and, uh, and so yeah, aging populations can be quite a big driver uh, of, of certain uh, uh, companies. Um, white space. White space, as you probably know, is a term used by people in the marketing uh, uh, and sales business. If they've got a map of, uh, of a world or a country or, or territory, somewhere where they've got no representation, no sales, they color white on the map, a white space. 
there's lots of white space around the world for people to grow into. I've given you three examples there, eyes. And what do I mean by that? Something like two thirds of the world that needs vision correction doesn't currently have it. They don't currently have access to reading glasses and other forms of uh, vision correction. They will get it in time. Uh, and clearly that will be a source of growth to people like Essel or like Zotica and so on, who are in the business of manufacturing eye and, and retailing eyeglasses. Payments. Um, we're often asked whether we prefer MasterCard or Visa or, or PayPal or Square or Apple Pay or Google Pay. Or, or, and, and the answer is, yeah, look, we've got a view on which one might be better than the other one and so on. But the reality is they'll probably all do pretty well. And the reason they'll all do pretty well is they've got an enormous white space to grow into. Something over 80% of the world's uh, volume of transactions is still done in cash, basically. It won't be. If we ask our grandchildren, if we describe to our, oh, so our grandchildren describing to their children, uh, I would have thought that once upon a time we would uh, get some uh, some uh, uh, some material made from uh, 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 a pulp uh, of, uh, of jute, some of that, and and plastic, and turn it into this note. We'd have uh, uh, holograms on it and metal in it and engravings on it to make it difficult to uh, to um, uh, forge. Uh, and then we put it in armored cars and transported to banks, which would doll it out to us to go and spend in shops. We would pay it back into shops, uh, pay it back into banks. And then that's how we get into the system. They'll look at us rather quizzically, given that all they've got to do basically is walk up to a counter with their phone in their pocket and pay for something. Um, and that clearly is the future. Toothpaste, a bit like eyes. Um, you know, again, something like 60% of the world doesn't yet use toothbrushes and toothpaste uh, to clean their teeth. They will. As I am fond of saying on this one, if you want to have a, an intimate relationship with somebody who started cleaning their teeth, best you take it up, I think would be uh, my way of looking at it. And so, you know, for people who are in this industry, like Colgate, there is uh, clearly a very long runway for one of a better term ahead of them. And there are other trends which are just out there, which, um, which we alight upon. Um, just put a couple down there. Pets. Uh, if I had to pick one area of secular growth, which appears to have a very, very long way ahead of it, it's spending on so-called companion animals or pets. Uh, pets, as any of you who've got them will know, are on a journey to becoming full family members. Um, our spending on pets is, uh, is rising very rapidly. Um, I'll have to update this statistic, so I know that I'm a few years out of date, but uh, uh, in the year that I last looked, which was probably about five years ago now, time flies, Americans spent $10 billion per annum on diet pet food. Uh, now, have a think about that for a moment. There are not very many pets that can open the cupboard. Uh, you could just try spending, giving them less to eat. But no, diet pet foods are what they buy. And of course, for diet, read more expensive and higher margin, um, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, 40% of American adults live alone. To them, uh, particularly during things like the pandemic, uh, a pet is, is an important point of contact, basically. If you wanted a, a cat or a dog in America during the, uh, the lockdown, you would have had to have gone on a waiting list at a pound, never mind at a breeder, uh, to, obtain, uh, to obtain this. Testing is something we like as well. People do more and more testing as time goes by. Is there horse meat in your burger? Um, COVID-19 has obviously given it a big boost as well. Uh, international trade, so it leads to a lot of boosting, of, uh, testing of commodities and goods and so on. And sometimes these two things cross over. One of our companies is the world leader in veterinary diagnostic testing equipment. Um, testing pets is very important for two reasons. One is, I said, they're on a journey like their human owners. More and more of them are being given healthcare, which is uh, as good as or even surpasses their human owners in terms of uh, what's spent on it. And the other thing is testing is more important for, uh, for pets than it is for the human animal for a very simple reason. They can't speak. It's no good asking them how they feel and where the pain is. Uh, so you have to do more testing to get a, an accurate diagnosis for pets. Take us on, please, comrade. Um, lastly, as I said, we need some way of warding off the competition. Take us on. So I'm turning over a bit. Uh, the so-called moat, one other Warren Buffett is, he says, great businesses not only have great returns and source of growth, they have a moat that we get around the castle to protect them from this attack. What constitutes a moat? Brands are a pretty good moat. Um, uh, you know, strong brands can last indefinitely if you maintain them with marketing, uh, and with uh, advertising, with promotion and with development. And, uh, you know, you will pay more for a brand than a non-brand. You, you will pay more for a primary brand than you will for a tertiary brand. Uh, control of distribution and supply chain. It's not just brands. 
if you come up with something new, if you came up with a new vodka during the course of this call rather than listening to me, um, well, great. Uh, but I'm not sure how you're going to get it in bars and, uh, and restaurants and shops because the distribution is already controlled by people like Piaggio and Pernod Ricard and Bacardi who own things like Smirnoff and, uh, and Absolute uh, and so on. Uh, you know, this, this is already a great goose. These are, these are people who have already got a very big control. Sometimes it's control of supply chain as well. If you want to compete with some of the modern dairy companies, particularly in the emerging world, people like Nestle and Danone, you're going to have to go and find your own dairy farms to convert to dairy farms and build the refrigerated supply chain and processing. And you're going to have to put your own fridges into the shops that hold this stuff. You can't put your, your goods into a Nestle fridge. So yeah, that's good. Installed bases of equipment or software, people who supply things, and once they've supplied them, you are reliant upon them for maintenance, spares, service, and it's difficult to change. In terms of equipment, things like elevators and escalators. Once you've bought a Kone or a Schindler or an Otis elevator escalator, 75% chance you'll sign the maintenance contract with it. That's where the real money is made. Uh, software, people who make software that goes into your computer to run your operating system, or to run your uh, uh, conference call like we've got now, people who make airline reservation software, uh, hotel reservation software, payroll processing software, et cetera, et cetera. Once you've got this stuff, it becomes very embedded, very difficult to change, and it gives you a, a tank drive. And lastly, patents. Patents, obviously, to some degree, reward off competition. They're our least liked form of, of competitive advantage, actually, because they do expire. Obviously, patents uh, expire. A good example of a competitive advantage that you can get with a brand and installed base long after a patent expires would be things like uh, Otis in elevators. It's the world's biggest elevator company. Uh, uh, Mr. Otis patented the safety elevator in about 1858. I mean, his patent had expired by the 1870s, yet it's still got the number one position, uh, basically. So we think actually the development of brands and installed base is far more important than patents. Just towards the end now, I, returns are persistent. Good companies don't become bad companies by and large or vice versa. You'll see this is quite a long run of data. It goes back to 1966. And it basically looks at companies with high returns on equity, that Warren Buffett measure, you can see on the vertical axis there. You can see the red companies at the top, which are gravitating around the sort of 20%. And you can see the low return companies at the bottom, which are gravitating around, around the, the 12%. So we're starting with a universe of companies that started with 20% and started with about 12% and looking at what happened to them over the intervening half a century or so. And as you can see, uh, not a lot has changed. The red ones are still very significantly uh, above the green ones. Uh, and uh, that's the case. You know, good company sectors don't become bad company sectors and vice versa. You know, airlines aren't suddenly going to become good businesses any more than consumer goods are suddenly going to become bad businesses. And, um, and they do persist. And it's partly these barriers. You know, the, the, for the companies down at the bottom to get into where the companies are at the top is difficult. There are real barriers to entry. Take us on, Conrad. Another example of the same thing. This is the return on, on invested capital for these companies. We've given you this by sector here. Uh, and you can see there are two bars. There's a red bar, which is a long run from 1963 to 2004, so 40 years. And then there's a gray bar, which is the latest 20 years. And so what it's telling you is what the return on capital was for the 40 years and what it was in the latest 20. And you'll see when you look across these sectors, there aren't any examples of a company which has gone from one end to the other of the a company, a sector that's gone from one um, uh, level of return to the other uh, at the moment. You know, we haven't suddenly found that transportation um, was, you know, around about the, uh, as you see there, I don't know, seven or eight percent. And, and but more recently, it's been in the 20 percent band. No, these things persist, basically. And if you look over on the, uh, you know, crane your head there, you can see what does well pharmaceuticals, household and personal goods, software, media, commercial service, semiconductors, healthcare, food, consumer services. Hmm, they're all pretty darn good, aren't they? Uh, what does badly over here? Well, we've got utilities, telecoms, transport, energy, materials, and retailing. Yeah, um, you know, they aren't suddenly going to turn around, basically. And as it says in the punchline at the bottom on the left there, being cheap or lowly rated doesn't, isn't going to make a bad company become a good company. It may give you a short-term opportunity, but it certainly doesn't give you a long-term one. Keep going, Conrad. Um, yeah, that's uh, the point that I was just making. Sorry, on that slide. Yep, and uh, I think with that, we are nearly there. Um, this looks at the actual share prices. So I've talked a lot about companies. And I said to you the reason for that, in part, is because that's my background. I came to 
fund management through running businesses, not the other way around, or, or, or I've just been in fund management all my life. But that's all very well, but how does it translate into performance? This is the MSCI uh, World uh, Index, and it takes uh, back to 1996, as you can see there. So we're dealing with uh, about 25 years here. And it takes the quality subsector of that index. So the companies that they define as high quality with high returns on capital, high profit margins, good cash conversion, and it compares it with the index. And you can see in any rolling 120 month period, so any 120 months, 10 years, in any rolling 12 period during this period, quality always outperforms the index. Now, quality is being slightly handicapped in this comparison, in my view, because of course the quality is still in the index that it's being measured against. If you subtracted quality from the index, I don't have the data to do it because it's an MSCI calculation, this, uh, it, this would be more extreme. It would be a more extreme outperformance than very probably for shorter periods as well. And I realize that that's a long period of time, but frankly, we are long-term investors. If you're not long-term investors, you are probably in the wrong fund, would be my suggestion. Comrade, keeps going. Um, and finally, I think this is it. Um, Buffett, as ever, is better encapsulating all of this stuff that I've been talking about than, than I am. Uh, it's far better to buy a wonderful company at a fair price than a fair company at a, at a wonderful price. As I said to you, I spent most of my working life listening to people asking me about whether something's cheap, whereas they should be asking about how good it is. Thank you. I think that's it, Comrade. Yeah. Terry, thank you so much. That's been absolutely fantastic. I'm going to pick out one uh, question first and pick on it because you started with your career and, and we haven't heard much about your upbringing. So I'm going to start with this one, if that's OK. What did you learn about managing your money from your upbringing? <laughs> well, um, I suppose I, uh, a few things. One is it's not much fun being poor. Um, somebody, somebody once said, uh, you know, it's um, what did they say? There's no point in being rich and unhappy. No, but I've got to tell you, being poor and unhappy is definitely worse. <laughs> and so you know, it does focus you on these things, I'm afraid, in terms of uh, uh, trying to get them. No, I mean, real things, persistence and hard work is important. Um, uh, I always say to, my, to various people, the day job isn't glamorous. People think that at Fundsmith. What we do is we spend our days with me striking a pose like Rodan is the thinker, me and Julian of doing this and having a great strategic thought now we had that about you know 30 years ago when i was setting up helping set up colin stewart about what works and what doesn't work what we really do is every single day we read company annual reports um, we read company uh, results we attend conferences we read industry publications we read elevator and escalator digest pet food newsletter tissue world there really are publications called this believe it or not to get background on companies we put this all into the, a database uh, in our research, our, our cloud research drives. We read it. We do calculations of the returns. Uh, we look at where we think the returns are going in companies. And it's really about applying yourself. That's what really makes things like this work. It's about execution. You know, um, Bright ideas are slightly more common than people think. And execution of bright ideas is extremely rare. Very interesting, Terry. Thank you. Let's, um, let's go a little bit. Let's stay sort of close to that. We think we know what your answer may be, but um, is market timing a waste of time? Uh, yes, I think it is. Uh, I, I mean, first of all, I've never actually met anyone who can do it. And I've, I've been around for quite a long time. So, um, yeah. and I think there are reasons why you can't do it. I'll, I'll give um, a couple of examples. One of them is that it requires a great flexibility of mind. If you are the person who foresees the um, credit crisis, um, and, uh, and, and positioned yourself for it, like Mr. Paulson did. Uh, John Paulson, his hedge fund, uh, did that and triumphed in terms of his returns. To get market timing truly right, you need to be able and willing to do the reverse at some point. So you need to be able to predict Armageddon, and then when it arrives and it's darkest, reverse, which of course he never did. Uh, you know, he went off into gold. And it's very difficult. If you, if you take as a, a starting point that you're going to want to be invested, for the long term, and I think that is almost not a debatable about, about what we've all got to do for our own financial well-being, then you need to be able to not only get market timing right one way, you've got to be able to get it right both ways. And that's one of the reasons why it's to do. The other thing is markets are what I call second order systems. In order to get it right, you not only have to be able to predict events and the timing of them, you have to be able to know what the market will do in reaction. 
my example, which I gave in my annual letter last year, is this. Imagine that I was very good at foreseeing the future. And I appeared uh, in, uh, in the back end of 2019, writing my annual letter, and I said, there's going to be a worldwide pandemic. And as a result of that, uh, there will be such an economic shutdown for government action here uh, that the US economy will have a 10% shrinkage in GDP in a quarter. If I was able to predict that and told you all about it, what would you have done with your equity portfolio as a result? Now, I, I rather suggest you'd have sold some or all of it, basically, which the, now we get, listen, the market went up 12% <laughs> in, in 2020. It's like, you need to know how the market will react to these things. Uh, there's an old joke story that kind of gets it. It's about the man who uh, wanted to make a lot of stuff. I'm just switching my aircon. I'm getting a bit chilly here. Um, the man who wanted to make a lot of money in the stock market. And so he sort of prayed that, that, that he would find, um, you know, next week's newspaper, or next year's newspaper uh, in the street. And he duly did. But the problem is he had the news page. He really needed the stock market page. <laughs> I'll, I'll pick one that's come through, actually. Um, uh, uh, do you think, that the morals of the leadership of an investee company are relevant to the investment decision. And they're citing uh, this individual, this client of ours is citing the recent Barclays uh, without going into uh, specific yeah, yeah. names, just the morals around leadership and how that plays towards your investment decisions. Yeah, I mean, the short answer is yes, I think so. Um, I, you asked me about my upbringing and how it sort of led to what I do and how I do it. I didn't touch upon this, because you know, don't want to spend all day to it. One of the things I was going to say that I had noted down here as I was speaking to you to touch upon is honesty. Um, the way I would put it is this. I never stole money from people when I didn't have any. So I'm not sure why I would begin. Now I'm quite wealthy. Yet I'm surprised by the number of people I meet who somehow can't keep to that axiom. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not condoning theft by anybody or, or, or anything like that. But there are some people in circumstances in the world where I guess we should be sympathetic and understanding. Uh, that they're in, you know, such a bad, uh, unless you've been in their shoes, stood in their position, you know, somebody who goes and shoplifts in those circumstances, maybe, you know, we should have in our heart some uh, uh, desire to, uh, to see what their problem is. But when people are chief executives in companies or running funds or something like that, and they behave in ways which are dishonest in terms of not giving true stewardship for people, not looking after their money as they would their own and so on, then I simply can't fathom it and I've got no time for it. Or, or, or just simply being too greedy. I, 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 yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's touch on, um, I know you don't like being drawn into the macro, but it's impossible to avoid you know, a, a, a raft of questions coming in on inflation uh, and interest rates. Um, mm. You know, we've had a, a few client questions on, you know, this theme. How do you see inflation panning out? And to what extent do you take inflation into account when selecting a stock? And invariably that will intertwine with you know your your view or not view around uh, interest rate cycle as well terry yeah okay yeah yeah i mean obviously those are topical um, and finally i think let's go back to my upbringing or, or at least my early career again um we're all very subject to recency bias is the first thing i would say if we're not careful and people talk about in, uh, inflation a lot now because it's an issue in their minds and then they're not wrong to think about it i'm not suggesting they are for a moment um but you need to get it in perspective. Um, I started working in 1974, uh, late 1974, and my first full year in work was 1975. Um, I wonder if uh, I give your, uh, your your listeners a moment to guess, no Googling you lot, uh, what the CPI went up by in 1975 in the UK? 24%. Wow. Right? wow. Yeah. Now, I lived through that. You went back to things you learned in the past. I've seen real inflation in action. Right? Uh, and uh, I can tell you, how do I see inflation playing out? I simply don't know. I mean, I, I don't feel that I've got enough insight into this to say. However, I'm not totally pessimistic about it, although we've clearly got inflation at the moment. The reason I'm not um, uh, uh, that pessimistic, pessimistic about it is if you look back at the facts, always a good place to start, you will find there's not any positive correlation or strong positive correlation between commodity prices and retail prices. Um, uh, in fact, there are quite strong negative correlations in the number of commodities over time. And the reason for that, and this comes back to how do you, because you said, well, Terry, how, about, how do you select companies you put, is the first impact of inflation is not on consumers, it's on companies. 
you know, we don't buy commodities. You don't go and buy commodities. You buy things that have been processed by companies. To, to buy. Even when you buy nitrogen, well, I buy oil. No, you don't. You buy gasoline or diesel. You don't buy oil. Um, when you buy food, it's, it's agricultural commodities which have been processed to, 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 deliver, to deliver to you, or it's electronics, things that have been processed in terms of resources, in terms of cobalt and so on, and lithium to make electronics. The first impact is on companies. It's not on, uh, and that may work through companies into consumers in the end, and then we'll have a real inflation, which means this. If you're trying to think of what company do I want to own in the inflationary period, own one with a high gross margin. Gross margin is the difference between revenues and cost of goods sold. Companies take in stuff, they take in ingredients, components, uh, services, do something to them, turn them into a product and sell it to you. And uh, that's your gross margin, the difference between those two things. Uh, the average gross margin in our portfolio is 60%, which is to put it in English for you, they make things for four and they sell them for 10. The average on the index is 40%, which is to say they make things for six and they sell them for 10. Now, if you're going to have a period of inflation where the, the cost of goods goes up by 10%, right? it's clearly a lot better if it goes up from 40 to 44 than 60 to 66, basically. The impact on your profitability, which was lower in any event in the other companies, is much greater. Uh, high gross margins are a buffer for companies, um, and they are also um, a measure of their pricing power. I mean, the best gross margin companies in the world are people in the software business uh, and people in, in goods where the cost of goods are very low, things like cosmetics. Uh, and in their case, I think you could have inflation and it wouldn't matter at all, basically. So that's where we look at it. The one thing where inflation, I think, will have quite a lot of impact negatively on, on not just our companies, but uh, the, the market in general, but probably disproportionately high on us, and you touched upon it, is if there is an, a, a, a big pickup in an inflation, which persists, and that's the other thing, it's not much just whether we've got inflation, we've obviously got very unusual circumstances at the moment in terms of COVID, the pandemic, the recovery and the supply chain. I don't think we'll know whether we've got secular inflation until we've lapped that, but if it does persist and requires central bank action, interest rates will go up, and when interest rates go up, valuations come down, basically. So I, I'm not, when you think about our portfolio, you, you, I regard it as a two-stage question. Terry, if there is inflation, are you worried about the fundamentals of your company? Not much, and certainly not compared with the market. Right? Are you worried about valuation? Yes, quite a lot. I think it could have quite a profound effect on valuation if, if inflation takes hold, persists, and there's central bank action. And that, that sort of tees up, um, you know, in, in, in your book, uh, you, you say, why buy bricks when you can uh, have mugs, I think. Um, <laughs> Should you invest in developed or emerging markets? Uh, um, you know, with so much going on in China now, what's your view on in, uh, investing with China, particularly with all the regulatory um, uh, yeah. issues going on there? Yeah, look, I mean, we do um, invest in emerging markets, both, uh, I mean, certainly with directly an investment trust which does it, but also, you know, it's important to bear in mind that our companies, whilst they're all headquartered and listed in the developed world, have a significant portion of their revenues probably gusting towards 30% in the developing world. We're already invested in reality, you know? It's where they do business that matters rather than anything. We don't have anything in our, in our fund that's listed and headquartered in the, in the emerging world. We probably will someday, but there's nothing that's come up that's got the, the quality uh, and liquidity that really fits our, uh, our portfolio, basically. Um, China is interesting. Our investment trust um, beat um, has got a very low rating on China, which has been problematic for it in the first years of existence and now a great benefit to it. We've always been wary of China in terms of the, the safety of the investment there, which is to say, you know, the ownership structures, particularly for anything in the technology area, are so-called variable interest entities. You cannot own, literally own these companies in China. You have something which is usually a um, uh, Bermuda or, or um, uh, Caribbean-based variable interest entity company, which has a piece of paper that says it tracks whatever the Chinese company shares do. Mm. Uh, there are certain situations in life where just being in the, in the same piece of paper as everybody else is the only solution. Um, and the second thing is, which I think people are beginning to find out at cost, when there is a conflict of interest between uh, the Chinese government and, uh, and the interests of outside investors, I can tell you which one is going to win, right? Uh, and we've obviously seen that already uh, in terms of what happened 
ants. We've seen it's what's happened with the education uh, companies in China, which have been uh, obviously severely damaged by government action and may be reduced to a non-profit sector. We're seeing it now in the real estate sector, not that, other than as an observer, that's of any great interest to us. Um, it's one of those things where I would say, I mean, I have some of my money in our emerging markets fund, and some of it is in China and some of our portfolio. It's one of those things where you have to accept, if you're going to do this, that the risks and rewards are quite different to what we do, right? Uh, basically, and you need, therefore, quite a strong stomach for that and the volatility that it's likely to bring. So it's one of those things that I would say, yes, but not with a lot of money, would be my view. And Terry, may, 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 maybe time for our last question and, uh, and I'll sum up. Again, thank you so much for your time. We heard you, um, in the, I think it was in the pandemic, you were hitting back at critics, you know, saying your fund was likely to uh, underperform post lockdown. I have to, in, uh, I have to mention this quote because I love it. Deserting rats on a ship which refuses to sink, I think yeah. was your quote. So, so really yeah. two questions stemming from, from that. Why do you think you know, people were and are so quick to criticize you when you've been so successful over the long term? Because you just cannot deny the track record over any period of time. And maybe how do you respond to comments you know, around recent investment performance? Yeah, I think the quote's actually a Helmut Kohl, the, uh, the former German chancellor, who said, nothing so disappoints uh, deserting rats as a ship that will not sink, I think was it. <laughs> is attributed to him. I rather liked it myself as well, but it's his quote, not mine. Um, why do people criticise? I mean, obviously, the answer is asked then, but you, you've asked me to speculate on it, so I will. I mean, I suppose envy is the most obvious answer. Um, we in Britain in particular, I think, have a traits somewhat some of us you know maybe commonly uh that i've always I, I started working in america in 1980 and um, uh, it's always struck me that one of the big differences between the american attitude to uh what we do business in general is somewhat different than the uk in the uk it seems to me very often the common thought for anyone who's a success is how do we stop them that's how do we get what they've got wouldn't it be nice to see them fail Whereas in America, it seems to me to be, I'd like to be the same as them. Uh, I'd like to emulate them. And I think that's a profoundly different thought process between, the, uh, between these two countries united by their, uh, by their common language. And I think that's a part of it. The other thing is, I mean, bear in mind that what we did was quite different to the industry. And so it didn't win us a lot of friends amongst the uh, general industry participants and their, uh, their legion of, uh, uh, of sort of uh, PR people and, uh, and media commentators you know we were quite clear from the very beginning of this that what we were going to do was a very different strategy in terms of the way of managing money uh, to the way the majority of the industry did it and that we thought that the way the majority of the industry did it wasn't very good um, we were quite vociferous about that and uh, i guess what i would um, say in relation to that is uh, there's a john maynard Keynes quote i'll give you which is not quite as snappy as the uh, as the helmet cole quote but i rather like he said He's, and he, by the way, apart from being an economist, was also a pretty decent fund manager. Uh, so he should know, as they, as they say, worldly wisdom teaches it's better for reputation to fail conventionally than to succeed unconventionally. People don't like people who are different uh, and do things differently. It upsets them, basically. And I think it's really a combination of those two things um, uh, that uh, is at the root of this. How do we respond to it? Um, I mean, we try not to get too worked up about it. We try not to comment on it very much um, and, uh, and just keep our heads down and do the day job, which I described to you earlier is mainly just a lot of quite hard work. You might say, well, if you don't try and respond, why did you write that in your annual letter? I was prompted by Conrad, I blame Conrad for this one, who said that he was quite, um, uh, I don't know, put out by uh, the press, which said sort of, you know, funds miss underperforms and there's an exodus. And, and of course there wasn't an exodus. I mean, you could, it was a, but they, uh, I guess the answer is they want to sell papers or pixels or something. And so they handed up. So comrade sort of, comrade and his colleagues prompted me to, uh, to say something uh, in response, but it's relatively rare to respond. By and large, we think that the numbers should do the talking as they should with companies. That's what should do the talking about what we do. Um, but we are happy to communicate around those numbers and say why those are the numbers and what we're doing to achieve them and what went right and what went wrong, basically. Um, and my standard answer when things go wrong um, uh, on a jocular sense is, um, well, it's Julian's fault, because <laughs> Julian's uh, our head of research. 
and I've worked together for 35 years, of course, so uh, he can bear it. But the reality is, blame me, right? That's, you know, when we get things right, and we will get things wrong, right? Nobody gets everything right. Well, well Terry, you know, you know, really with that, with our, our sort of pro-US and our global approach to investing, we'd like to be uh, one of those firms that celebrate your success and actually really take this opportunity to thank you for you know, the incredible returns that um, your fund has helped provide our clients. So, you know, I really want to take that opportunity to- Well, I, I just, I, well let me just respond and say, thank you for your support because uh, um, without any clients, we don't have a fund. And, and we do have a fantastic relationship and it, and it goes beyond just the return. So uh, I'd like to thank, uh, you know, on behalf of our colleagues and our clients, you know, uh, thank you not only for today, but also, uh, for the great working relationship that we have had, you know, over over the years. Before before we do go, there, I'll, I'll just wrap up with like, you know, five or six observations that I made, and maybe maybe for our clients, distinct advantage of having run companies. These are the things that resonated with me, and you know, uh, making a good fan, fund manager. Do some simple calculations, and amazing how so many fund managers have that data available and don't do it, um, you know, it's not rocket science. These are two numbers and it's right in front of us. And I think what really resonated, Terry, was, you know, that coming back to your comment around persistence and hard work and execution, you know, uh, uh, the glamour one sees in the headlines, but, you know, it's all the devil in the detail. That really resonated with me. The mathematical fact uh, that Charlie Munger referenced it's a, um, you know, it's a high grade business with a compounding value um, that will give you one hell of a return and try and not uh, market time it. Uh, fascinating to hear about the secular growth and you know, pets and the growth that maybe the pet space can have over the years. Um, you know, and quality will always uh, uh, do best uh, in the long term. And maybe I'll leave it as a final point of just um, uh, looking for honesty, looking for honesty in colleagues, looking for honesty in investee companies uh, 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 and, and potentially friends. So um, those were the things that resonated. And uh, again, Terry, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having us on, David. We appreciate it.